Hey there, folks, and welcome back to the Akenia campaign. Last time, uh, what did we do last time? Oh yeah, we <laughs> did some cultural stuff. It's been a moment since I played. We uh, decided to go ahead and, uh, oh, yeah, we can't modify this right now. But what we did do is we uh, revoked the tax exemption that the, uh, the upper class of our nation were enjoying. I also, in probably one of the unintentionally funniest things I've done on my channel so far, made a big deal, seemingly ironically, about the, uh, the fact that my research uh, per month went down from about 12 point something to 9.1. And if you watched the video, you might have thought, oh, he's, he's making a joke, he's making a gaffe, he's, he's having a chuckle. I was not. I actually genuinely had forgotten that uh, it was at 12 something and thought that 9.1 was way better than what I had before. As it turns out, the reason for this big change, despite improving the output, is because of the happiness. So it's those uh, short-term, five-year-long happiness malices that are causing most of that dip. That will eventually go away, and this is a better change for research purposes in the long term. But yes, in the short term, our research rate will be a little reduced. It's so much better than what it was when we were a tribe, so I'm not going to really cry too long about um, a few years of a couple points less Plus, we're always converting people to citizens and nobles, and we have really, really buffed up nobles in Londinium. And we might even uh, proceed with that into a Wernum, actually, as well. We could build some academies over here. There are quite a few nobles who live here. So a lot we could do, actually, to counteract that. But uh, last episode was really focused on doing infrastructure stuff in Kantiakia. And so this time around, I'm going to be looking a little further afield. Now... Something I have not checked before starting the recording, like I thought I might. The goofs uh, were happening there. Where is my... Do I not have a naval range map mode? I thought for sure I put that on there. Um, all right, where is the naval range map mode? Naval range, here it is. Okay. So I think if I'm... So if I'm reading this abstract art piece correctly... Uh, the red is outside of naval range. Yeah, yeah. So this is as far as our range extends. Um, this is, by the way, confusingly, this is different than the port range. Or actually, it might not be, because now we have a port in Manawiya, so that is adding to that. So, okay, this actually is the same thing as the port range. So as you can see here, we currently have the situation where we have this section... Uh, in the north that we cannot traverse through without attrition, but almost everything else is taken care of. We could build a port around here somewhere to fix that very easily, but this is not likely to be a huge problem. It just means we can't travel around super freely. However, quite handily with the Manabia port, all of Hibernia is within our naval range, which is very handy for Hibernian invasion plans, which is going to be the theme of this episode. I have been sitting around recovering my levy after spending tons and tons of it to get that achievement. <laughs> A very meta thing to do in this supposedly uh, minimally meta uh, let's play. Who am I kidding? It's very meta. but um, <laughs> And I've been accruing this treasury, my political influence, as always I am slowly and painfully accruing, and uh, my stability is getting back up there. Aggressive expansion is getting back down there. We're finally getting back into reasonable levels of aggressive expansion. Now, uh, how am I going to go about invading Hibernia? Well, I talked uh, for several episodes now and then about different possible places to attack. I think focusing on like taking uh, the Brigantes with their ports isn't as important as just taking land that lines up with our mission tree better. So if we look at our Caledonia mission, and again, remember, Caledonia includes the actual region of Caledonia and the... okay. The region of Caledonia includes the Caledonian area as well as the Hibernian area, but it's all technically within the combined region, which is called Caledonia. So got that settled away. Um, if we look at this here, wait, wrong one. If we look at uh, no, wrong one. Uh, which one am I looking for? This one here, um, Hibernia uh, Septen Trionalis. This is the first Hibernian one, I think. These other ones are in the north of Caledonia. Yeah. This is interesting. This actually cuts off one of the other. Hmm. Well, I'm likelier to start colonizing Caledonia before I fully take over all this land, so probably the, um, or I mean, sorry, the Hibernia side, not the Caledonia side. I'm likelier to start colonizing Hibernia before I go up that far north into the Caledonia area. So 
Let's see here. This uh, buffs up the Urkii family. Okay, interesting. All right. Anyways, so the only area of the Caledonia region we actually need from Hibernia is Hibernia Septen uh, Trionalis, this northern portion. And this lines up as well with our nearby territory, Manawia now being a very good staging point for an invasion up here. So let's go ahead and just take a look. We obviously can't do anything right now. We don't have the influence to even start getting the claim. And I will get the claim manually. I'm not going to wait around for this terrain to be under my control. Um, it, again, like, you know, I, I just can't deal with this colonization situation. Uh, Gabrocentum and uh, Colunium don't have the uh, integrated culture down. Is there any way I can manually get this modified? Um, dominant culture. So if I can just move tribesmen, or can I not do that anymore because I'm no longer a tribe? Yeah, I can't do that anymore. And I don't think slaves count for colonization purposes. So I probably should have done that before I became a monarchy. I don't think... I think actually that this was... Uh, I wasn't thinking about this because I became a monarchy many episodes before this situation was happening. So it's fine. Not much I can do. These areas just have to naturally grow and become a Kenny. Getting these places colonized is just going to kind of have to wait. And this one especially is really out of the way. So in the meantime, actually getting some territory over here might be better in the, uh, in the short term as well um, with that in mind. So all that being said, we're going to knock... So this gives us the claim on Hibernia Sem, Sem, Septentrionalis. I'm never going to say that right. But um, there's no reason to wait around. I, I'll need to get this... I'll need to have this done to get this mission anyways. But this is just to have the region. I, I don't need to do it through this claim. So if we uh, manually forge a claim and we pick a target that brings in other targets in an alliance, that will be the best case here. These guys are very uh, diplomatically isolated. They're a, a, a negative state with all their neighbors. What about you? You're at war with the revolt, that's right. And you're allied with uh, Voluntia. So this seems like a pretty good first target. They're very close to Manawia, so they're very easy to land in. You could take their fort super easily. And they're allied with uh, Voluntia, so that gives me a nice fat area of targets to go after. Same with you. You're allied with Dorinia, so that alliance is mutual. Of course, as alliances tend to be, of course. So that all looks good. Yeah, so that is all solid. Okay, our target is going to be uh, Dorinia. And for us to go to war with Dorinia, we're going to have to go ahead and fabricate the claim, which means waiting around for the political influence to do so. So that's great. Meanwhile, we have some other stuff happening before that, to pay attention to a civil war is actually brewing once again and this is because of that um this is when i reloaded the game from my last episode this popped up that's why this is new this is because of uh the thing we did with revoking the census tax exemption some of those nobles are actually the leaders of the great houses of Pretania, so that's unfortunate so uh, their power base is enough that this is going to be a problem. We basically need to bribe one of these people to not be disloyal. Who is the closest? Looks like uh, Luke, uh, Lucterius Welbus, head of the Welbii family. Can I put you over the edge? I could do this through bribery, but then that's several months of political, political influence. I could do something else instead. Can I give you the free hands? No. You have an office, okay. You're also in very poor health, though. Do I chance it and wait this out, hoping that in the next uh, two years, basically, this character or this character or this character, any of them die? This is Inimicus Urcus. It's possible they will, right? So let's chance it. We still have about a year and a half before we really need to do something about this. I can always just bribe some of them to get this taken care of, and the Civil War... Should be fine. The only danger with this is if we wait on this, the uh, the ratio of power base to the threshold could increase if their power base gets bigger, which would speed this up, and I might not notice that. However, I will be paying very close attention on every monthly tick to see where the ratio actually is currently, so I trust in myself to be able to avoid that problem. All right, this all looks fine. Let's go ahead and resume. Also, I've been checking, and uh, Brigantia still does not want to buy Manawia for free. I'm willing to give it to them completely for free. 
while they have a negative opinion of us, it's just not going to happen, so it's just a waiting game. That's fine. Having Manawia be in our control isn't a bad thing. It is providing us uh, nothing, but hey, I mean, at least uh, we know for sure that Pork won't be dismantled by Brigantia. Right. Anyways, um, let's see here, 43% efficiency. That's fine. Let's take a look and see what's going on around here. Rome is winning against Carthage. Carthage and Rome are at peace currently. They're not in a truce state, though. They have mutual Cassus Belli. Uh, Carthage has... Who do you have? Oh, just some random, yeah. Carthage has been integrating all their, their vassals around here, and they've really taken over North Africa, as usual. Rome is really pushing into Illyria, all right? Looks like Rome is going to start butting heads with Mac with uh, Macedonia and the Antigonids. I'm actually kind of impressed the Antigonids are still around. They usually have more trouble than this, but the usual Anatolian chaos is happening. Seleucids are holding on pretty well. Maria is consolidating as usual, and they have not broken the Seleucids quite yet. Ooh, cursed Armenia being invaded by Antigonids. Yikes. All right. Uh, meanwhile, let's see here. Rome's at war with Sardinia, so they're t they're cleaning up the isles over there, all right? They've got their starting italic uh, subjects, plus a few new ones. Let's see here. Any alliances? Nope. Rome is diplomatically isolated, as usual. Now, throughout this series, we have been becoming a bit of a trade friend with Carthage, which is a pattern I do intend to continue. I will spoil that after I start to take over Hibernia, and I'll basically go back and, f back and forth between... Uh, Caledonia and Hibernia. Another project of mine is to actually begin making my way into the Mediterranean and establish essentially a colonial presence in the far more lucrative Mediterranean trade regions. Now the way I'm going to do this is through uh, Iberia. Um, this uh, region here gives me very good like reach into the Mediterranean. Plus um, Carthage, who is the main other person in the region right now, uh, they're in the very bottom, so I'm not going to come into conflict with Carthage if I start to take over land in Iberia. Plus, the trade goods in Iberia could be quite handy. I think there's uh, precious metals around here. Yeah, actually quite a lot of precious metals, far more than Northern Europe. So lots of gold to be found all over the place in Spain, which is historically accurate. And some of that stuff is pretty near the north coast here. So if we take a look at our uh, naval uh, range map mode again, I should probably just put it on my bar, but I'll do that later, in between episodes. Um, it is it is a little ways outside of our naval range, to be fair. However, um, we can uh, kind of establish some colonies on the way there, and that basically means pushing towards the Gaelic uh, west coast. Now... What would we go for here? Well, if we take a look at the regions, we have the Amorica region, which is a natural kind of like next place for us to aim for on the north of Gaul. And then the, uh, look, excuse me, the uh, the Aquitania region down here. Now, if we look at our naval range again, which I should just really put on the bar, but what I, I'll replace the population with naval range, totally fine. All right. Now, um, we can't quite reach into the uh, Aquitania region, but we could set up some sort of little colonial area up here, possibly uh, at this region here, Assisimia. This would be a really natural place to establish a region under our control, under a uh, feudatory's control, because it is uh, this peninsular area, pretty defensible, uh, extends our coastal range quite a bit. So Assisimia could be a... Um, a mainland Europe uh, target for us in the future, but that's more long term. We'll worry about that after Hibernia. First, though, the granaries have been raided. We have received word from local officials that the province of Domnonia, or of the province of Domnonia, that several important provincial food stockpiles have been looted by malcontents owing to the contempt for the government across the area. The, the contempt for the government has got to stop. It is still. Actually, is it disloyal still? No, it's not actually. It's now loyal, but maybe not that loyal. Well, this is fine. This will give us a chance to get a boost in loyalty. This is actually a pretty good event for us because Domnonia's disloyalty has been a recurring thing in the series for a while. We can ease the shortage and improve their loyalty by quite a bit. Absolutely worth it. Let's do that. 
Very good. So that puts them now firmly in control. And one thing we can do to improve naval range quite a bit is build a port in Ulconum, like I said that I would do for many thousands of years. So let's go ahead and do exactly that. Build the port. Get that done immediately now that we're able to. And uh, yeah, very exciting. Any other buildings here that I want? No, not really. Yeah, no precious metal buildings or anything like that. Okay, it looks like actually our disloyalty problem has solved itself. How did this get changed? It's the same characters that are disloyal, but their power base just shrunk by a lot. I'm not really sure why. Okay, I don't know how this is being determined. Uh, this is one of those under the hood things. I still don't quite understand with this game. So I'm not gonna question it. I'm just not gonna look a gift horse in the mouth here. That's fine. Twisting the knife. Donwin Diwika, for reasons uh, known only to herself, has begun to view Inimicus Urcus with jealousy and distrust. Even having them in the same room as one another is bound to result in hostility. Troubling. That is actually kind of troubling, because this guy is very powerful. He's probably the third most important character in the nation after Donwin and um, Kaeltrim. He is, of course, the, the third original tribal chief from way back in 450, almost 50 years ago now, coming up on the, the anniversary of our start of the game here. Um, yeah, that's alarming. Um, we could try to assassinate Inimicus, which would be very monarchistic of us. <laughs> That'd be right on right on topic. But he's kind of just dying on his own. He's got inflammation, he's lapsed, he's got a diphtheria pretty, and arthritis. He's in pretty bad shape physically, and he's very old. I really do think he will die soon. So we probably shouldn't chance that plus seven aggressive expansion is a monumental amount. The um, the tyranny isn't as severe. And Donwin could always be found out. That could possibly hurt her prestige or just cause trouble in general. Let's not chance that the guy is very old and will probably die soon on his own. So no need to worry too much. Hmm. Now the funny part is now getting the money to build a city is actually not that hard to get, but it's the, again, the political influence that is slow. All right, finish the port in Londinium. So we're getting the three ports there just so we can build medium ships, plus it offers other bonuses to a city, so nothing wrong with doing that, I feel. We can always improve our, or we can always add more building slots through the province investments if we really need to, but no rush. All right, slowly ticking up. Let's check again. Sell territory. Manawia, nope. Yeah, they're just not gonna ever accept it. Well, it's a negative, I feel. That's fine. <sighs> At least Carthage now likes us, so that's a good, a good change. Now, one very interesting, kind of extreme action we could take in the future is actually an alliance with Carthage. This would be a series changing decision because that would place it in a position to actually enter hostilities with Rome directly as Rome and Carthage will 100% fight more. Like look at the situation here in um, Sicily, in uh, Sicilia. It, it is, this is not a, a long, like, oh God, look at this border war. It's not gonna stay like this. Uh, Rome and Carthage will 100% fight more and the Punic Wars will sort of start in earnest. I guess this is sort of a, a post-First Punic War arrangement right now. But um, yeah, so that would certainly introduce a lot more action to the series. Maybe not in the right way though, because that Rome is very strong. I'm very scared of Rome. Uh, they have a lot of ships too. They have 117 ships. Actually, what is this cursed reality we live in? Rome is the naval dominator of the Mediterranean. Are we looking at land-based Carthage right now? I don't like that at all. Okay, well, that's a little alarming. Rome is winning the naval game, oddly enough. Despite having, I think, a... Uh, I can't see it, but they actually have a tradition uh, for being Rome that directly makes their ships more expensive, I think. Oh, here it is. Okay, this is what I thought would happen. We bring sad news. Inimicus Urcus died from overwork at the age of 77. He was the physician, and he was a pretender to become king and a rival of the Queen of Britannia. He was head of the Urquii family. Now, despite having just speculated about possibly trying to assassinate him, I will take a moment to bow my head in respect, even begrudging respect, for Inimicus Urcus, who is a 
MVP of this series. He's been around for literally 49 years and played a probably the most minor of the three original Chiefs, but still an important role in the history of Ikenia and the kingdom of Britannia that followed. So despite some mixed relations near the end of his life, he still deserves all the honors that he, uh, he earned. And with that, of course, immediately we have to reassign the physician slot. Who's going to be solid here? Let's take a look at the family situation. How are the Urkii feeling? They're feeling pretty fine, actually, so we don't, we don't need to worry about that too much. So let's actually get someone who's qualified. We could get one of these uh, minor character Orgatorii. You would be very good at it, so that's a good start. Uh... Or could assign a, a Dewey I'd probably want to assign a Dewey just because I really would like the ruling family to have a lot of uh, additional political influence and whatnot. So, not literally political. I would like that too, but like in the conceptual sense. Um, so, we're going to assign a uh, this guy here, uh, Anna Rostes, who is. Um, where do you fit in the family here? Boyrix. Who are you? Okay, I'm not sure who these characters are, but um, you're in the Dewey family somehow. Okay, I'm not going to question it. <laughs> this game doesn't really have like very good like family trees. Like, and again, in this game, the houses are not like a family, an extended family. It's more like a like a clan of people around, like centered around a family, and then all the retainer families. It's it's actually more similar to like uh, feudal Japan uh, houses, where it's like you're in a house, even if you're not, like, blood-related to the family. It's more about the loyalty, which I guess, to be fair, is actually like ancient, you know, Rome and Greece, where uh, being in a household was actually more of a, a bond of loyalty and kinship than blood relation. But anyways, we'll go ahead and assign you. Oh, man, you're starting off in a really bad state. And we have a lot of old characters here, so this health bonus needs to improve pretty soon here. That's fine, though. Anyways... Whew. Well, that takes care of that situation, and our loyalty problems are now gone. Who are you? You're the daughter of Inimicus Urcus. Are you now the head of the family? No. Who's the head of the Urcii family now that Inimicus is dead? Is it uh, Brito Marius? Wait, hold on. I'm looking at this wrong. Um... I recall now that I, I was never able to find this very clearly. Primary heir, chancellor, researcher. Uh, jeez, all right. Um, hold on. Oh, I can look at it like this. Okay, so Brito Marius, Brito Marius is the head of the family. Okay, that's fine. It usually is going to be another old uh, character with a lot of um, power base or popularity. You're one of the most corrupt characters I have, actually, as well. So um, that's an issue. However, your power base isn't very big. You, you've never been a tribal chief, so the tribal chiefs have a lot of power base from those veterans they accrued over all those years. In fact, I should probably continue paying off veterans uh, in the background, shouldn't I? Oh, maybe not, though, because Donwin might die. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I remember why I didn't do that anymore. Okay, that's fine. We'll just leave it alone. All right, the, pol the port is done. Let's take a look at how this affects our naval range. Actually, uh, not that much, but it does extend it a little bit. We can now get as far down as the Pictonia region. Any reason? Okay, that would put us into the Aquitania region. I, I should have said Pictonia province, not region. A confusing words there, but... I do still think going into like what's the modern day kind of Brittany Brest area around here is the place to go. This is a really defensible place to kind of set up a a Kenny presence on uh, mainland Gaul. Plus, it's mostly controlled by just one faction, so that's easy for us. We just have to fight uh, Osismia. Um, this is one of the situations where it's Osismia and then it's Osisimia is the name of the region, so that's great. <laughs> Love that. Who are you allied with? Uh, Venea. Venelia. Vene Venelia. 
I don't know in Latin how you pronounce that, but um, okay, that's fine. I'm not too scared of this little alliance right here. They're not in defensive alliance at all, so pretty solid. They have a Cassus Belly on me, actually. That's interesting. And it's permanent, too. So this is a mission Cassus Belly. And you are actually trading with me. Okay, that's a little awkward. Let's actually adjust that right now while we're looking at that. So I'm getting my wood from them. In fact, is it worth getting just one wood? I'm not actually sure it is. Wait, hold on. Am I getting my wood from them? Oh, I'm selling wood to them. Okay, that's fine. When, well, if I go to war with them, the wood will become available again. I'll just resell it at that point, so totally fine. Okay. And we could uh, fabricate a claim and whatnot, so yeah, that's fine. But first, Hibernia. No more delaying. <laughs> we have our target. Manawia is ready to support a naval invasion. In fact, we're going to... Actually, no, let's not do that. We're going to have to use um, this... Uh, this navy to move our um, our army up there, our levy. So plus a levy will spawn on Manawia, another four guys. So that's handy. Is it worth actually going into, into Manawia and like uh, doing like a governor and whatnot? I'm still hesitant to do that because um, that would give a character a lot of power since they'd be the second of two governors after the ruler of the nation, who's the governor of Britannia. Um, although this would improve the bad provincial loyalty that we're experiencing right now uh i do i do want to eventually sell manawia to Bragantia. i suppose i i could just keep manawia more permanently i hadn't been planning to but Bragantia could always like have the chance of destroying the port and i really want this to have a port on it and i will eventually take over all of the Bragantian. So I'm going to feed all this territory to Brigantia, and then I'll eventually annex them from being a feudatory, or I guess integrate them is the right word. But that's going to be such a long process, and it really might still be fine to keep Manawia in my control during that time. I guess I could probably do this. Um, all right, let's assign a governor after all. All right, um, maybe pick someone who is very loyal to the, the family that we like. Make sure that's going to be fine. Ideally, a, uh, a Diliki uh, character with good... What's the good governor stat? Finesse? Yeah, good finesse, ideally. Um, let's see here. Sort by finesse. I was already doing that. Lots of Orgatorii. We could uh, adopt another Orgatorii, but adoption costs a lot of legitimacy, so I'd rather not do it that often, unless I have a really, really good reason to. Uh, let's see. Um, also, the marshal might matter a little bit, but we're not likely to have... Like, this is just in Manawia for right now, and this uh, governor won't be leading a huge army ever within their lifetime, probably, so not a big deal. Okay, we have uh, Ven Venoma Diwika, who is the daughter of Donwin, so that's a good start. Okay. But would that create a problem with that person being hostile to the adopted Diwika character, Keltrum. Possibly, but they're both in the Diwika family, so any problems there shouldn't spill out into the, the broader politics. So, Venoma Diwika, you are merciful. So, uh, Freeman Happiness in her territory, which will just be Manawia, and that's as far as that goes. And then she's also prominent. So, better air attraction, better prominence, better province commerce, Actually, that's kind of handy, because I will be selling a lot of um, uh, resources from the Caledonia region through her as governor. So if she's governor for a while, and that includes the points at which I'm exporting goods uh, from that region, that will actually help. So looks good. All right, that's taken care of. This is now almost under control, and... Uh, this is such a... Like, of course she picks the the only one that's useless. But I don't want to... I'm about to get... Okay, we're going to leave it. I'm, I'm, I know. I know. I really want to change it. But it's only four characters, four population. Changing it to the conversion is not helpful at all. And honestly, um, I'd rather spend the, the political influence on getting the claim. I've been waiting around for too long. Not going to wait anymore. So that's that. Meanwhile... What are the Antigonids up to? They're fighting Armenia, Iberia, and uh, whoever they are. 
port's done, all right. Slow kids have a lot of, slow kids are a piece. Okay, looks pretty stable over here. It looks like Macadon has really kind of been smacked around by, of all people, the Antigonids, all right. They're also at war with the entirety of uh, Greece, so that's a standard Macedonian conduct down there. All right, the port's done, very good. We have another disloyal character. Who do we have now? Oh, this character is disloyal. Good lord. All right. Well, your power base is not that big, so it should be fine. We're just going to hold off. Yeah, making that... Removing the tax exemption for the, the nobility really did ruffle a lot of feathers there. <laughs> I suppose I should have supposed... I suppose I should have guessed it would. I supposed I should have supposed. That's a, a great misadventure statement right there. All right, finally. Fabricate the claim on that. Let's go. And off we go with that. <laughs> so, very exciting. Now, I could have saved the political influence and done some law changes. There are a lot of laws I need to change, but honestly, my manpower is desperate for being used for for its uh, for military purposes. So, I just I don't want to wait anymore. Um, also, our tyranny is at zero, which you know what that means. It is enslaving the nobility a clock here on the fair isles of Britannia. And we need to do something about that. Lofty notions. Keltrum and Dewekis and his dream of high office are fairly well known in the court of Britannia. But recently he has been lobbying more urgently of his suitability and deservedness for the role of marshal. Really? Uh... While ordinarily we would appoint, we would be able to appoint whoever we like to the post without causing offense or starting rumors, the enthusiasm of Keltrum has put us in a rather awkward position regarding the incumbent official... Uh, Vicinius Orgatoris, who actually is very, very qualified to be the marshal. Um, let's see here. Keltrum, maybe this just isn't your thing. So he gets content in life, which I'm not sure what that does, but he loses a little bit of prominence, that's fine. Uh, this Orgatoris guy, who's again, the Orgatorii were disbanded as a great house, remember, in a very weird uh, endgame event, <laughs> and so he's a minor character. Um, and this is because Donwin is persuasive. All right. Keltrum, just got to take one for the team there, my friend. No worries at all. Yeah. All right. Come on. Come on. You want to buy my island, don't you? No. All right. <laughs> it's not even moving at all. Ah, well. I tried. And now I have a governor there, so now I actually do want to keep Manawia, to be fair. So, that will. I might grab this, because I don't think I can change this when I'm at war. Is that right? I can't remember. Maybe I can change it when I'm at war. You think I'd remember the mechanics of this game that I play so much, but... Oh no! Keltrum died! Shoot. We bring sad news. Keltrum Dewekis gave in to frailty at the age of 77. He was the primary heir to become king. He was a member of the Dewekai family. Wow. I was not expecting him to die before Donwin. I guess he was like six years older than her, so I don't know what I was thinking. But yeah. Damn. That is a shame. He's in the clouds now. Uh, I guess, what did the Celts do? They burn the bodies, right? I think that's what they do. Either way, another sad loss in this episode. Another original tribal leader who, much more than Inimicus, was very important because he often stole the leadership of the army from Donwin, the rightful leader. But let's not bring that up at his funeral. <laughs> um, he was a great guy, and he went out with a lot of unfortunate things happening to him at the same time. Uh, but... Yeah, that, that's a, a situation that we have now. Because now, what's going on with our, our succession? The succession is now going to Segovax uh, Dewekis. Okay, who are you? You're the Chancellor, so you don't have any power base. You actually have a couple... Oh, no, hold on. Oh, you're Donwin's husband, that's right. You're the, uh, you're the King Consort, okay. I suppose that's fine, honestly. <laughs> who are you? 
I'm so mean. It's, I, I like talked about Sego Axe at the very start of the series, and I said, oh, this character, I'll remember who this guy is. And then he's never come up since. He's been a very background character, letting Donwin, you know, really take center stage. Okay, well, he's very loyal, so that's good. Um, not parent of the primary heir. You are the, the current leader, or you are the current uh, primary heir, you fool. Um, all right, well, that's fine. And it looks like the second most prominent person here is Ande Cambogius, who I believe is the... What? Null family. Okay, some some weird interface glitching here, but he is the child of Brennus Dubicus. I don't know who that is. I'm not entirely sure who you are, actually. Not not him, but like the guy I was just looking at. Um Andy Combogus. I've seen this he's the researcher, I know that. I've seen this character before. Of course there is Boyrix Dubicus, our golden boy that we're trying to push into a leadership role. How can we boost up his credibility? Probably by having him be in the war, right? Give him some support. Or getting rid of support for other people somehow. I'm not really sure. Anyways, let's resume. Uh, well, that's a shame. Lots of uh, unfortunate passings this episode. I'm actually kind of sad because I, you know, it's been several months now that I've been making this series, and so even though that's a little less than the almost 50 years that this game has simulated, I do feel a connection to these characters because I have been looking at them for so long, been thinking about them, been using them in my my evil uh, world conquering conduct. Um, so, yeah, poor run out for our fallen boys. The minor chieftains of the Akeni tribe, back uh, before when it was actually the Akeni tribe. Very sad. Well, actually, Donwin, weirdly enough, she's the last one standing. She's still here kicking around. 71. I guess I should have realized she was not actually very old. Also, I probably could have... I can't do it now, but... Oh, I can do it now. Oh, no, I can't do it now. Because, uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, Brigantia is my only bordering... Oh, what's this? Oh, I can adopt a different kind of monarchy. Okay, so I don't, I don't know exactly what I did to earn this option, but I could, I could if I wanted to, change to a stratocratic monarchy. Um, this makes our... We basically adopt a Spartan-style monarchy. They're the ones that start as stratocratic. It's basically a military dictatorship-themed monarchy, which... Um, what does it do exactly? Here it is. Okay. So, oh yeah, I looked at this last time. Um, it, g it gives us those modifiers. I think I'm fine not changing right now. Um, again, those changes really, that's more min-maxing than what I need to accomplish right now. I'm more focused on other business. I'm fine. Would I start off as an autocratic monarchy? Yeah, that's fine with me, honestly. I like having the religious idea there. Um, I don't need two military ideas. That's probably, honestly, the, the main reason I wouldn't switch to stratocratic. Um, it gives two military ideas. I could, like, I had so much trouble even thinking of which one of the military ideas I wanted to pick, because they're, like, I really am focusing more on infrastructure now. So having the, uh, the civ bonuses from having the, uh, the religious ideas available, that's more handy than the extra military idea, so no need to change. Some of the other, like, I think I said before, plutocratic is one alternative I might consider, because I have a very commerce-themed nation. And that's going to continue happening as I proceed, but not stratocratic. Not going to really fit my my situation here. First Ripple 499, which means we actually could fit in a northern war and feed our vassal a little bit. Or could we? Do I actually have any claims? I think I do. Oh, yes, I do. All right. Northern War is on the table against our former little friends in the No North with our new little friend in the North, Brigantia. So, what do we want to accomplish? Probably taking Texalia. This is the next logical province to aim for. Which means probably fighting Texalia, and then they'd bring in Karnonakia. Is my truce with them over? No, I'm still too early. I need to wait a few more months. That's fine. 12th of September, let's wait. And then, let's war. I want to use my... Yeah, I'm almost at the manpower cap. Now is the time for war. I don't even want to wait until the uh, Hibernian claim is ready. 
Because now's my chance to sneak in a, a very quick war in the north, he says, uh, famously having said before every difficult war that it'd be a quick war. <laughs> I suppose we'll see. All right. Get your, your pause fingers ready, because it's about time for the pause. There it is. All right, our truce is up. Yes, I think. Yes. Here it is. All right. Brigantia would not join. Oh, okay, yeah, because they're a disloyal subject. That would be a problem, except I get military access conditionally because they're my subject. So that's fine. I don't need them to actually fight in the war. I just need them to let my army move through and, like, land in their uh, territory. So should be fine. So many reasons to not do this right this second. We are almost at the cap, so this is a good time to go for it. These guys would still accept an alliance with me, even though they hate me. These guys are really in a tough position. They, they're they really in, like, between a rock and a hard place. And with my navy, I can land in all their various exclave regions. Let's do it. But We'll take Texalia. Now, I don't know in the mission tree where this fits in, but the mission tree would need us to actually own all the uncolonized land also, which will be such a long process. I'm not going to worry about it, <laughs> honestly. We'll bring in Karanakia. And actually, hold on. I can't give the land to Briganti if they're not in the war. I'm so glad I just remembered that. Although, actually, I hmm. if I took the land myself, I could then sell it to Brigantia later, but then we might have the trouble we've had with Manawia, where they don't want to buy it from me. I think I... Uh, pfft, dang it. I think I just need to wait for Brigantia to become loyal and then fight the war and have them join in. I forgot that feudatories can uh, decline join the war um, if they are disloyal, which Brigantia is still. But within a few months, it will be uh, back to a loyal state, which means actually the Hibernian War will probably happen first. That's fine. In fact, my levy and my navy will be in the... I guess I have to lower my, my levy to, to clear the war. But anyways, that's going to be it for this episode. We've uh, gone long enough. Next episode, we will actually do the Hibernian War as long promised. Finally, some more, some more warring in the series. I'm sorry for the slower pace the last couple episodes have taken. But as you've seen, it's not that there's nothing going on. There's actually quite a lot going on economically. And this is really where my success later in the mid game will come is by setting up my economy and my infrastructure correctly right now, early on, uh, before 500 ABC, uh, when the mid-game kind of starts to happen. And if we're going to be doing things like allying Carthage, which I am thinking about, uh, that would really take the series in a new global direction and would put us into conflict with some pretty big hitters. So we need to be ready for that if we're going to do things like that. So that's all. Uh, that, that all being said, thank you so much for watching, and I will see you all next time.